I'm not too much of a singer. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crack. Jacks. I don't care if I ever get back where we'll root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. One, two, three strikes you out at the old ball game. Welcome back into the Real Man Report. Uh, thanks, Aaron Gnurk from the Big Dumb Fun Show. Of course, our producer, he uh, he uh, would make sure that all the music and clips go together for us. And Take Me Out to the Ball Game by Buck O'Neill uh, hits home for me. I, I, I do a Monday night show, and we haven't been on in a while, but we're going to come back here soon. But I do a, a Monday night show with Bill Ivey on I-70 Baseball. Follow them on Twitter at I-70 Baseball. They're another blogging site. Great for Cardinals and yeah. Royals coverage. Um, he sent me a the speech from Buck O'Neill uh, at the Hall of Fame, and it's about eight minutes, and so to not take time away from from Bob, and and because his time is so valuable, we don't want to keep him here any longer. We have to. We're going to insert that post production for anybody listening live. It'll be on the post show at some either at the end or maybe in this seg- right before this segment. But uh, in that, he uh, he talks a lot about going through the trials and tribulations and and everything that was Buck O'Neill. But you were sharing with us off the air a little bit of what you thought during that speech. Yeah, you know, as I went back and looked at the uh, video of the speech and then, of course, saw photographs from it, you know, I can now tell that he wasn't himself. You can see it in his eyes. And so, you know, it, and it's so, sometimes it's easy to go back in retrospect to kind of start to put the, the pieces together. And, you know, there were certainly telltale signs that something wasn't right. And, of course, Buck, being Buck, never, ever let on that anything was wrong. I think Buck knew he was sick uh, a lot longer and well before he ever mentioned anything to any of us because he didn't want us worried. He didn't want us pitying him. He didn't want us to be concerned. He just, that was just Buck. He was, you know, he was not going to be a burden or in his mind become a burden to anyone. And so, you know, he kept all of this to himself. And now as I go back and look, I can kind of piece it together and you can see it. And, And the thing was, you never, you know, a guy 94 years old, you just don't know when he's going to finally start acting like he's 94. But again, I don't know what 94 is supposed to be. <laughs> but, you know, Buck seemingly defied age. And, and so he was so youthful. He was so spry. He was so charismatic that when I started to notice these signs of him slowing down, you just almost say, well, you know, the man is 94 years old. And, and so uh, but in retrospect, you could kind of see uh, something wasn't right. Yeah, it's I, I, I recently this past week I went back and read Joe Posnanski's fantastic account of uh, Buck O'Neill and that you know that that rise up to the Hall of Fame uh, I guess elections for lack of a better term um, the Soul of Baseball which yeah. is a fantastic book uh, one of my favorite baseball books and there's so many just great moments in that book uh, one of them is you know just the the kind of irony of how Buck O'Neill does all this work. You know, he's the spokesman for this entire generation of players almost who have been left out of the hall of fame. And when it comes down to it, he's not elected and he's not brought in. Uh, Go tell us that story of, of kind of afterwards as he's reading the list of names of the people who did get in. Well, you know, he was so excited, man. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and as I was sharing with you guys, when you were, when you were down, down at the museum, I think I could have handled it better had it been one or two people that had gotten inducted. So you would have said that, okay, the the process was so stringent and it was so, you know, so challenging that we had to look at these criterias. And and so we went with one or two people. But when you put 17 in Mm -hmm. and you leave Buck out, now that one was a hard pill for me to swallow. But when I delivered the news to Buck that 17 of his colleagues had gotten in, he hit the table in utter jubilation. He is excited. He mm-hmm. is genuinely excited. Joe Paz and myself, we're not as excited as Buck was mm-hmm. because for me, there was no limit. They could have put all 35 in. And so once you put 17 in, 
the process already is if if you believe the process is going to be watered down, it's already watered down at this point. So there was no reason that you couldn't put number eighteen in. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but Buck is genuinely happy. And and when he asked me, he said, "Do you know the names?" Well, I didn't have that information at that point in time. And and as I mentioned, the very next words that came out of his mouth is, "I wonder if they'll ask me to speak." And Joe Joe Posnansky was sitting opposite of Buck. And he looks at Buck, and, you know, Joe is already, he's turned red now. He's mad. <laughs> and, and, and he's like, Buck, you wouldn't do that, would you? And, and, Buck, and Buck said, of course I would. And then I kind of excused myself, and I told the guys I'm going to go down and tell. We had this massive group of people who had come, and they were all gathered on the Field of Legends at the museum uh, waiting for what we thought was going to be a Hall of Fame celebration announcement. And I told the guys, I said, I need to go down, and I need to tell the folks the verdict, and then I'll come back and get Buck. And, Buck, I think you should address the group so we can let everybody go home. And I tell you guys, it was the absolute longest walk of my life Hmm. from the second floor of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum downstairs to our gallery on the field of uh, field of legends. I don't know what it feels like to be on death row, but that was as painful a walk as I ever had because I didn't think that I was going to be able to get these words out without breaking down. Uh, And, you know, I'm telling myself, you know, I'm talking to myself, I'm trying to pump my own self up. You know, you're a (laughs) professional. This is part of your job. You know, you cannot break down. And even today, I have no idea what I said. Uh, I said something to the people, whatever it was that I said, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. There were some 300 plus people who had gathered there for what we thought was going to be this Hall of Fame celebration announcement. People are openly weeping. Buck walks into the room. And of course, the room erupts into a huge, thunderous ovation. And then Buck O'Neill walks up to the podium and he gives one of the most amazing concession speeches that I'd ever heard. (laughs) And, And really, guys, in that instance, He literally wrapped his arms around a baseball world who was mourning the fact that he had been so callously omitted from uh, what we all thought was his rightful place in the Hall of Fame. And he wrapped his arms around all of us and said, it's okay. It's okay. Don't be mad. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry at anyone who had anything to do with this decision. Just keep on loving old Buck. If I'm a Hall of Famer in your eyes, that's all that matters to me. It was an amazing thing to actually witness. And Bob, you know, you talk about how this this moment and the thunderous applause when when uh, Buck walked into the room, and there was there was my greatest memory of Buck O'Neill. Is it almost brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. It was just I went out to a Royals game one time with my dad. It was just a random Royals game. It wasn't any sort of special Negro League uh, tie-in or anything. And Buck was just sitting in you know what's now his the Buck O'Neill yeah. legacy seat at the game, and they showed him up on the jumbotron. There wasn't any sort of a uh, of a tagline across or anything they just showed him and they literally had to stop the game from continuing because the entire stadium <laughs> stood up and gave him a standing ovation i just couldn't believe it like to this day i still tell people about it and i still talk about how it's one of the greatest sports moments of my life just because i thought it was so cool and I, it, it just kind of looking back on that being one of the greatest memories i have you know you talked about all these stories of bucks i mean it, it's it's impossible to pick one i know but if, if you could you know what's one of maybe one of the greatest memories that you hold from Buck O'Neill from all your dealings with him in, wow. in your whole life. And, and, and you're right. There are many. And I, and I tell you what, that moment in February of 2006 was one of the most amazing things I ever saw in my life because the strength that he exhibited, you know, that and, and, and I guess it all comes from really knowing yourself and having confidence and that self-belief uh, to understand that the Hall of Fame didn't define who you were. And I, and I think that was a tremendous display of of courage and strength but you know probably one of my favorite moments with buck was playing golf you know on many occasions we played golf together (laughs) but on this particular case we played our last round of golf together uh that summer of 2006 with the great writer dave kindred who uh, wrote for many years for the sporting news and dave was writing a piece on buck's love of golf for, for golf uh for golf digest and um, we go out and we're playing Wolf Creek, which is a very difficult golf course for anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, now Buck is 94 at the time. And anyway, I'm, we're driving out to Wolf Creek and I've got Buck in the car. And I said, well, Buck, you know, we're going out. We're going to play Wolf Creek, a very exclusive golf course. And, you know, they don't even allow women to, to even come on the premise. He said, you don't say. And he sat there for a minute or two and he said, Bob. You think they're going to let us play? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I said, yeah, Buck, we can play. And so we get out to Wolf Creek, and my good friend George Hobbs, who works for Easy Go, and Dave Kindred, myself, and Buck. 
and we go out and we play this round of golf and Buck shoots 94 at age 94. And we're sitting at dinner that night, and he looks over at me and said, well, you know, Bob, I shoot my age, but that ain't a good score anymore. <laughs> you know, and, but, you know, and Dave writes this story around this, like, 70-foot putt that Buck makes. We're playing this par five, and Buck had hit a bad shot uh, to get things going, but he, had fi- he got on, you know, on his fourth stroke, and he needed to make this putt to save par. You know, and he's a good 70 feet away from the hole, and, you know, and Buck is a little upset with himself, and he gets up to the – he started talking to himself, so I show him something, Buck. You show, you show these young boys something. And he hits this putt, and wouldn't you know it, he drains it from about <laughs> 70 feet. Wow. He's running around like a little kid. I told you I was going to make it. I told you I was going to make it. And, and that moment for me kind of cap – it really does. It kind of capsulizes and crystallizes that great spirit, uh, but almost, you know, also how much fun we had – on the road, eating dinner, eating breakfast, traveling, playing golf. Those are memories that I'll just hold with me for the rest of my life. You know, and I'm, I'm, we've got people in the chat room that are just getting all sorts of choked up here. And I tell you, <laughs> I, uh, I've never had an episode where I've had wet eyes. And, and this, is, this is amazing. A little, mean, little dusty. Um, kind of just a quick note. I don't want to get you in trouble on anything. So if I ask anything <laughs> that can get you in trouble, <laughs> please feel free to not answer. But the obviously there's the Buck O'Neill seat at the Royals. Are they um, financially involved with the museum? Do they help you guys out, or is that just a way to honor Buck? Oh no, the, the seat? no. The, the uh, Royals have always been great partners of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And it's a mm-hmm. relationship that we're really excited about. It's a relationship that continues to grow and get stronger. And uh, you know we're we're working. They're working really hard to make sure we're in a great position as we look get prepared for the All Star Game. They're supporters of the Buck O'Neill Birthday Celebration. Uh, the the legacy seat was absolutely brilliant. It, I don't think you could have come up with a better way to remember Buck and to pay to pay tribute and honor to Buck. You know, there were a lot of people who were questioning what was what would happen with his seat. Some wanted to pull it out and memorialize it. Man, that seat's too good. Buck would have never wanted that seat to go empty. And But to recognize ordinary people who do extraordinary things, it's all about mm-hmm. service. Buck O'Neill lived his life to serve others. And, and to have that kind of juxtaposition where – Ordinary people who do extraordinary things are recognized with the opportunity to sit in Buck's seat. Absolutely brilliant on the case of the Royals. Well, we got about a minute. Uh, we're going to come back on the other side, and we're going to do 15 more minutes of this. Like I said, this has been an absolutely amazing experience for all of us involved in the Royal Men Report. Obviously, we're all here. It's, it's rare that everybody from the <laughs> Crowded show. Crowded house. Whole <laughs> <laughs> house in here. Yeah, I mean, we got this it. has been an amazing experience. But earlier today, we filmed the very first uh, fake Ned Yost cavalcade of characters or something like that. But it had on <laughs> it had on it Isaac, local KC band Isaac James. Um, you can check out uh, ramblingmorons.com. You can check out uh, the first show, but check out Isaac James and all of them. But I wanted to tell a quick uh, tie in here. Isaac James, uh, lead singer Gill, his sister has a sculpture in the uh, Buck O'Neill uh, area. Her name's Reen Patterson, so check out her sculpture the next time you're there. And uh, we, uh, we'll get your opinions on that when we come back. But we'll be back on the other side. 15 more minutes of this of what is going to be the greatest show we've ever done. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're excited to have an exclusive interview with the new iPhone 4 Assistant, Siri. Hello, Siri. How are you doing today? Thank you. It's nice for me to be here. Siri, you've been pretty busy with the new iPhone launch. What do you do for fun? It's just been crazy around here. I've been looking for a place to get away and wind down, but I have not been able to find anything my style on the plaza. Well, have you tried Kelly's Westport Inn? I show Kelly's Westport Inn to be at the corner of Westport Road and Pennsylvania Avenue. It's got way more than that. It's been voted by The Pitch as one of the best places to meet guys in Kansas City. It's got a great laid-back vibe, plenty of TVs to watch sports, an awesome pizza place in the back, and plenty of drink specials during the week. You say it's a nice place to meet guys? Accessing, accessing. This sounds like the place for me. Shutting down now. You can't shut down. If you want to meet Siri and other great Kansas Cityans, check out Kelly's Westport Inn, 500 Westport Road in beautiful, laid-back Westport. Tell them the Royal Man Report sent you. Big Ned Minute. Oh, who did that? Holy crap. What a week for sports in this area. We had wins by the Tigers, Sporting KC, Alex Gordon got a gold glove, 
and Kansas managed to take one step closer to firing Turner Gill. But the ultimate this past week was Philip Vagisil Rivers, who managed to grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. First, by showing such leadership skills as screaming at his own players, whining to the refs, and just generally pouting. Then, he managed to go to pull out the biggest booger a quarterback has ever done by fumbling the snap with 42 seconds to go, prompting the Chiefs to win in overtime. <laughs> you make Ron Washington's Texas Rangers look like the 27 Yankees. And what a precious moment after the game, when Rivers was seen mouthing, Worst day ever! That is darling. Make sure, Phil, to write that in your BFF's yearbook on your way to prom. And please, sweetie, don't get your skirt caught in the elevator. This has been your Fake Ned Minute. Fake Ned Minute. Oh, who did that? Welcome back into the Royal Man Report and our special Buck 100 edition with Bob Kendrick of the Negro League Museum. Uh, it's been a very emotional day here at the Royal Man Report. We've got people crying in the chat room. We've got stories being batted around the chat room at royalmanreport.com or livestream.com slash royalmanreport. Uh, again, big thanks goes out to Bob Kendrick for taking the time both last week and this week to uh, to do this with us again. And, you know, I'm just I, – I absolutely can't thank you enough, first off, because I'm just – out of my mind this has been an amazing experience for me i i'm so upset that i didn't get the chance to to take in the tour with the guys because i think it would have been i know it's going to be an experience for them that they get a hold on to forever um we were kind of talking about major league baseball's involvement with the negro league museum one thing i always think about and i think it's what sets some players aside from others is of course on the field is what matters to most fans Mm -hmm. but i think sometimes there's something to be said for being a good person in baseball and when when you uh when you're working at the museum, how often do you get requests from be it the Royals or other teams to have players come down? Do they just come in like normal people, or do you get sometimes requests for teams to come in? What's it been like with Major League Baseball? Well, you know, most of the time we'll get the request. They'll give me the heads up and say, "Hey, you know, we've got some guys from the White Sox, or this year we had guys from the from the Orioles, or we had guys from Arizona Diamondbacks when they were in town," and so. You know, they'll typically give me a heads up. CC Sabathia makes this a mm-hmm. regular visit when the Yanks are in town. And, you know, it was interesting. We were playing the Buck O'Neill Golf, uh, Golf Classic when the Yankees were in town this year. And CC calls me, and I left the golf tournament to go meet him at the museum. He's a huge Negro Leagues fan. As you can well imagine, his favorite player is Satchel Paige. <laughs> uh, and and what, what is not to like about Satchel Paige, so I can certainly understand that. You know, and so we're getting more and more of the guys to come by and visit the museum. We need to get more of them. We continue to try and make that outreach effort to get those guys in to get a chance to see what this is all about. You know, this mu- museum is something that every baseball player, irrespective of color, should come in and experience. Because as I was sharing with you guys last week, there is no greater example of love of the game than when we talk about the story of the Negro Leagues. These great baseball players truly love the game to endure what they had to endure to play this game in the country and to prove that they could play this game as well as anyone. And that's a story that never goes out of style. And I would say not only every major league baseball player, but I'm talking Little League. Absolutely. You know, college, high school. You you mentioned something last week that, I mean, this is – this is all about baseball. All those guys wanted to do was play, baseball, play ball, and man. they endured hell. Oh yeah, and that's all. And, and I got I got tremendous chills when you said that. But all they wanted to do was play baseball. That's it. They just wanted to play ball. And so, if they had to sleep on the bus and eat their peanut butter and crackers because in the town that they had just played in and just filled up the ballpark, they couldn't get a meal in that town, or they wouldn't have a place to stay, or they couldn't even use the restroom. But they would never allow that adversity to kill their love of the game. So, you know, they would. they sleep on the bus, eat their peanut butter and crackers, move on to the next town, put on a great show and, until they got into an area that offered black establishments so that they could get something to eat. But, you know, and that's why I say you won't experience a greater demonstration of love of the game than you do when you look at the story of the Negro Leagues. And you're right. Every kid that plays this sport, every professional athlete, they should all come in and 
and get a better understanding of what others really endured to play this game. But not only that, how good they were Mm -hmm. at this game. You know, you're not just talking about a bunch of guys who were just out there playing baseball. These guys could play. And and they, the Negro Leagues would take a backseat to no league. You know, and I I still think, guys, the most difficult thing for our visitor to understand is that there were two professional baseball leagues operating at the same time. One, we know everything about the major leagues. The other, we know very little about the Negro Leagues. And so people are just now discovering these great baseball heroes. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up. I mean, for me personally, I, you know, I had a, I got a history degree from the University of Kansas. So the whole idea of history and then when you mix in baseball, that whole story, you know, when you go to the museum, the first thing you see is, you know, everything you start at the beginning. You yeah. start with baseball. And, yeah. you know, as long as there's been baseball, there's been... You know, there's been black baseball, white baseball. It's it's the same game. Yeah. And you get that story as you go through the museum. The thing that I really took away from it was that you know, you've got all these news clippings and you know, you've always got all those. But the oral history and the stories that you tell and, you know, what you hear about this personality or this player and those things, that's what really makes it come to life is because you're not just reading it. You're hearing the stories. You're hearing about, you know, how they were traveling on the road and how... Yeah. You know, they would be, you know, you show up and in Kansas City, for example, you could have Charlie Parker right there by Satchel <laughs> Page, you know, and that's that's history. It's right there. And it's something that a lot of people don't always realize is there. And I don't think the story is told nearly as much as it should be and could be. And, and it's history that is unique to Kansas City. Mm-hmm. You know, I always like to say that the Negro Leagues Museum is Kansas City's gift to the rest of the world. But it is unique to Kansas City. You can't get this anywhere else but in KC. And that's what makes it so special. And, you know, the the stories are just so rich. And they're entertaining and they're inspiring and they're compelling. And, you know, when Rube Foster established the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City and Rube being the tremendous visionary that he was. And and I still say the greatest baseball mind this game has ever seen that nobody knew anything about was Andrew Rube Foster, who would draw a circle on the first baseline and a circle on the third baseline. And if every one of his players couldn't drop a bunt inside that circle, they would be fined. Rube Foster would fine his players as much as $5 if they were tagged out standing up. They were supposed to slide. (laughs) You see, you know, he was so adamant about the style of play that became signature Negro Leagues baseball. Very fast, very aggressive, very daring. So they would bunt their way on, and they'd still second. They'd still third. And as old Buck would say, if you weren't too smart, they steal home. (laughs) And and it was such an exciting brand of baseball in comparison and contrast to the major leagues at that era, which was a base-to-base kind of game. So guess what? At Negro League games, you actually had black and white fans sitting side by side watching, truthfully, guys, the most entertaining baseball being played in this country. Some will argue the best baseball being played in this country. And we've still got a lot of chatter going on in the chat room, but Katie, she's our friend that I was referring to earlier who, who grew up around Buck and had the ability or had a, an experience that none of us have had of being around him and talks about how he, how he did everything with humility and, and, and what have you. And he's just, oh, my God, he's, this, this has been such a great night to hear all these stories <laughs> in the chat room. And, and, I mean, they really just need to get you. Somebody needs to go in and just put you on tape. And, I mean, you go, you know, let, you go him, to the, let him go. <laughs> right, you go to the K and you go in that little room in the museum and you watch that video on the Royals. And I tell you what, I maybe I've seen it too many times, but I know you guys have a theater there. They need to do something like that where they alternate at at Kaufman between the Royal story and the Negro League story because I would love to hear you tell this story and to hear people like Katie tell their stories at the K in that theater once in a while because I think I think we're just missing out. I, I really never understood how valuable the museum was until today. I, re- I really can't speak to that enough. And, again, I'm so glad those – I forget which college you said it was that, that got you guys on Twitter. Webster. Web- Webster my friends University. over at Webster University. <laughs> I'm so glad they did because I know that, like I said, the Royal Men Report, we're going to buy a plaque for us come Wednesday. And, you know, I would love to do one singly if I could right now, but we're going to do one together. You know, that's going to get us a membership you were talking about. You can go to the website, uh, Negro League uh, Baseball Museum.com. Uh, it's just the acronym, NLBM, NLBM.com. NLBM.com. And uh, go there, check out their membership options. There's all sorts of different ones. And even if you can't afford a membership, God knows we're in a recession, folks. But if you have a little extra money, definitely look at that. And we're not the kind around here to beg for money, but this is a cause that, that I truly believe in. 
get out there, you know, give give ten bucks, give a hundred bucks, whatever you have, but make sure you're helping these folks out because it's uh, priceless. And, and, and you're right. And and if nothing else, bring your family to experience this. Mm-hmm. You know, if nothing else, if Kansas City will come down and support what is truly one of the best baseball and history museums anywhere in the country, that means just as much. Because I think once you walk in there, you will walk away celebrating again and cheering the American spirit because that is what the foundation of the Negro Leagues is all about. It is America at her worst, but also America at her triumphant best. And you will love, you will walk away having fallen in love with this museum once you come and experience it. We, uh, we got about five minutes left, and we can't. This would not be a real uh, podcast about the Negro League Museum and about the Buck O'Neill story without the story you tell about Cool Papa Bell. Well, you know, there's so many great stories about Cool Papa Bell. And, of course, the one that everybody <laughs> loves is the fact that Satchel says that Cool Papa Bell was so fast that he could walk in a room, turn off the lights, get in bed, pull up the covers before the room went dark. Well, that is a true story. Cool Papa and Satchel were teammates on the great 1935 Pittsburgh Crawfords, one of the greatest baseball teams ever assembled. Five future Hall of Famers playing in their prime at the same time. So they had Satchel, Cool Papa, Judy Johnson, Josh Gibson, and Oscar Charleston on the same team at the same time. Dynamite team. Well, when they traveled, they were roommates. So in this particular instance, Cool gets to the hotel room before Satchel does. Turns on the light. There's a delay before the light comes on. Cool sw- flip the light switch off. There's a delay before the light goes off. Well, Cool Papa <laughs> says, uh-huh. When Satchel gets to the room, Cool's waiting for him. Rumi, I'm so fast, I can flip this light switch off, run over, hop in bed, cover up before the room gets dark. Satchel was so out. You know, Satchel was just like, oh, well, Cool, you fast, but you ain't that fast. <laughs> and so Cool Papa Bell bet his meal money, and old Satchel took the bait. And in one of the greatest sports pranks of all time, because that light had a shortage in it, Oku was able to flip the light switch off, run over, hop in bed, cover up before the room went completely dark. (laughs) Satchel was so outdone that he just always told folks that Koo was that fast. So that's how that legendary story came to life. Love that story. There is a (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what an amazing story. And I tell you this, Bob, we've got, like I said, we've got a few people in the chat room at RoyalManReport.com or RoyalManReport.com slash live stream. And it looks like a lot of $20 bills are like It's kind of a pledge drive. There's there's all of a sudden a (laughs) pledge drive in in my uh, chat room here. And uh, um, it looks like. We're going to have a few more, let, let's just say we're going to have a few more uh, donations to the museum before the end of this. And that's what it's about. I mean, yeah. you know, we are so happy to have Bob on. I, I really can't speak to that enough. And this has been such a, a phenomenal experience here. And uh, as we as we kind of run out of time here, uh, want to tell us a little bit of the Don Newcomb signing bonus story? Oh, what a great story. I love and, that story, too. And, <laughs> and this story is this story told directly to me from Don. And the story that uh, we're talking about is Don, of course, joined the Newark Eagles and Effa Manley was the female owner, the only owner to be nominated and inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. She and her husband owned the Newark Eagles. Her husband was Abe Manley. So the story has it that she wants to sign a young Don Newcomb to a minor league contract or to a preseason contract. It was going to pay him $100 a month if he made the team $400 a month. So Mrs. Manley had this huge mansion in Newark. They bring Don over to the mansion, sit him down strategically at a little table that looked up at a spiral staircase. And when she, when he was to get there, they were supposed to come up, give her the signal. She's going to come out of her bedroom. Newcomb sits down, he says, and they go up, they get Mrs. Manley. Mrs. Manley comes out wearing a beautiful red evening do- uh, gown that had a long split right up the middle. And so Newcomb says she kind of sashays her way down to the table <laughs> where he's sitting, sits down in the chair opposite of him, crosses her leg, and, and the split on the dress open up. And so Newcomb says, I signed my contract right there on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess that is definitely a great kind of bonus there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Bob, I, 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 I say it now. I said it last week when they I, – I don't know if I told this story on the air or not, but I was out of town for dealing with uh, my stepfather who's very ill with liver cancer when these guys went to the museum. I get an email from Mike the next day that says – it was to me and Chris, it says, 15 minutes isn't going to be enough. Of course, we had Jason Parks on finally last week. The first time in the history of the show that we have two amazing guests that we can't just bump somebody out of the way to let you go an extra 15 minutes. You know, so we we have this conversation. I'm like, well, there's nothing we can do now. We get you on the show, and uh, and by the time we had you on – 
we were winding up, and I ran over to the phone because I had asked these guys as we were going out in your last story. I said, do we want him in studio next week if I can get him? And everybody <laughs> resoundingly like, said uh, yes. yes. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we're, we're out of time here today, and we could honestly probably talk to you for another hour. Please, folks, go out to the Negro League Museum. Check it out. Uh, you know, donate if you can. At least go out there and, and pay an admission a couple of times a year. Help those guys out. Let's do some quick hits here. First off, the website for the museum, www.negroleague or nlbm.com. Uh-huh. And uh, you can donate there. Uh, firstwatch.com for information on that. On, and, and you can get also on the museum's website, too, for the uh, First Watch event on Friday, November the 11th. Big autograph signing uh, at 11 o'clock, right after the run. The 2.2-mile run is at 8 o'clock. Big autograph signing at 11 o'clock with George Altman and Joe Carter and a bunch of other former Negro Leaguers. Come hear them talk about Buck and the impact that he had on their lives, and then they'll sign autographs afterwards. And then we'll party on Saturday night. <laughs> we'll party on Saturday night. We'll see some red dresses out there for sure. And nice. don't, don't pass up a red dress. <laughs> well, <laughs> never pass a red dress. Guys, um, you know, we, we don't do the norm. We normally have an, an intro where we go or an exit where we go around. We just don't have time. Check out Mike's website, kingsofkaufman.com. A lot of great stuff coming from Fake Ned. Find him on Twitter, fakenedyost.com, royalmanreport.com. Guys, we are out of here. Thank you so much. We will talk to you next week. Tell me if this might describe your situation. You're a Royals fan. You have been your whole life. It's been a long road, but you think the team is about to turn the corner. But then it's the winter, and your wife starts to nag you about how much football you're watching. She says she wants to be fair. She says you need to rake the leaves. Suddenly, everything you've worked for is all on the table. The television, the DVR, the case of beer. Might I suggest to you another alternative? You need to go down and have a cold beverage at Kelly's Westport Inn. Hell, bring the wife along. If it doesn't work out, it's been named one of the top places to pick up single guys. Maybe you'll both get lucky. Whatever you do, get out of the house. Get down to Kelly's Westport Inn. The choice of a laid-back bar is an important one and should not be made solely on podcast advertising alone. Kelly's Westport Inn and the Royal Man Report, partners you can count on. A worthy honor for a baseball great, but not the one fans of Buck O'Neill had hoped for last year. KMBC 9's Brenda Washington gets fan reaction to news of what the Baseball Hall of Fame is planning to do. Old country preacher said, dead noses can't smell roses. The fact Buck O'Neill wasn't inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame still riles people. Even though he did fall one vote chart, they should have put him in anyway. I think it's a shame not for just um, the Negro Leagues, but for all of baseball. Talking about Sanchez said, all right, so now is the time to prove this thing. At the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, the house that Buck built, they are going to honor him in the Hall of Fame. Word was spreading. The Baseball Hall of Fame will honor Buck with a Lifetime Achievement Award named in his honor. He should have been in a long time ago with other people prior to uh, uh, 1947. I wish he uh, had gotten uh, honored while he was still alive. A little bit too late, but, you know, it's never too late. And it's it's still a good thing. The Negro Leagues Baseball Museum director says the award is a worthy honor and puts Buck's name in an even greater spotlight. What the Hall has done now is created an even greater stage. You know, it gives even greater meaning to the contributions of Buck. Supporters also say this will give a big boost to building Buck's dream of converting the old Paseo YMCA into the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. We think that we'll pick up some steam now. As for what Buck might say about the award. The greatest thing in all of my life is loving you. Brenda Washington, KNBC 9 News. Buck O'Neill died last October at age 94. The Lifetime Achievement Award will be presented every three years. The Hall of Fame will also erect a statue of Buck inside the museum in Cooperstown. We wanted to know if you thought Buck's posthumous Lifetime Achievement Award was too little, too late. And a majority of you who responded to our survey think it is. 77% say yes, it's too late, while 23% say it's not. You can still take part in our survey by logging on to KMBC.com and clicking on Sports. You'll also find our breaking news coverage of last night's announcement by Baseball Commissioner Bud Seeley.